The Portrait of Sigismondo Pandolfo Malatesta by Piero della Francesca is an embodiment of power and authority, reflecting the intricate political landscapes of the 15th century. As a condottiero and lord, Malatesta's life was steeped in political manoeuvring and the constant struggle for dominance. The portrait, with its strict profile view reminiscent of Roman emperors on ancient coins, conveys a sense of timeless command. The austerity and directness of the gaze suggest a leader accustomed to being obeyed, while the richness of his attire speaks to the wealth and cultural sophistication that leaders of the time aspired to as symbols of their status. The dark, unembellished background places the entire focus on Malatesta himself, emphasizing his role and presence. Piero della Francesca's use of geometric lines in the composition adds to the sense of order and control inherent in Malatesta's persona, while the profile view evokes a sense of detachment and perhaps the loneliness that can accompany great power. Maurice Quentin de la Tour's portrait of Maurice of Saxony, the Marshal of Louis XV's armies, is a powerful depiction of military command and nobility. The Marshal, known for his victories and strategic expertise, is portrayed with a confidence befitting a man of his stature. Adorned with the prestigious Order of the Holy Spirit, the pastel rendering accentuates his distinguished career and the respect he commanded. The portrait exudes an air of authority and nobility, capturing the marshal's keen gaze and dignified demeanor. De La Tour's masterful use of pastels creates a vivid sense of realism, particularly in the rendering of textures, from the softness of his skin to the gleaming armor, evoking the tactile qualities of the materials. The subtle play of light across the marshal's face and the armor he wears reflects his dynamic character, and the significant role he played in the political and military spheres of the 18th century. Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres's portrait of Louis Francois Burton exudes the authority of a man of intellect and influence. Known as a significant figure in the world of journalism, Burton's presence in this portrait is commanding and dignified. His direct gaze engages the viewer, reflecting a man accustomed to the scrutiny and power of the press. The posture, solid and unyielding, suggests a man of substance, both in character and in his role in society. Ingres's painting style is renowned for its precision and clarity which is evident in the finely rendered details of Burton's attire and the chair he sits in. These elements, along with his firm stance, suggest a man who is both a thinker and a doer, someone who shapes opinion and policy. The portrait is not just a personal likeness, but a representation of the changing social landscape in 19th century France, where individuals like Burton were carving out new paths for the bourgeoisie and challenging the traditional aristocracy. Eugène Delacroix's Portrait of a Turk in a Turban represents a European artistic tradition of Orientalism, where the East was depicted as an exotic and mysterious place. The painting captures the romanticized view of the Ottoman Empire that was prevalent in 19th century Europe. The subject's direct and intense gaze, adorned in a richly colored turban, suggests an individual of significance and authority. Delacroix was known for his vibrant use of color and dynamic composition, which is evident in the contrast between the turban and the subject's garment. The detailed rendering of the clothing and the choice of colors not only convey the opulence often associated with Eastern attire, but also hint at the power dynamics at play during a time when the Ottoman Empire was a significant figure on the world stage. The portrait, while not of a specific individual, 
represents the broader themes of power and cultural intrigue that were a part of the fascination with the Orient during Delacroix's lifetime. Jupiter and Tatus by Auguste Dominique Ingres is a grand portrayal of the mighty Zeus. Jupiter in Roman mythology, the king of gods, and Tetis, a sea nymph. Ingres, known for his neoclassical style, presents a scene from Homer's Iliad, where Tetis begs Jupiter to honor her son, Achilles. Jupiter's powerful, muscular form seated on a throne amidst the clouds, and Tetis's gestures of entreaty convey a narrative full of divine might and maternal desperation. The contrast between Jupiter's stoic, almost pensive expression and Tetis's earnest pleading captures the complex relationship between the divine and the mortal realms. Ingres's use of fine detail, fluid drapery and the subtle interplay of light and shadow emphasize the scene's drama. The composition, with Jupiter's almost colossal size dominating the canvas, reinforces the theme of the gods' overpowering presence and the mortal struggle for favor and justice. The painting is emblematic of the Romantic period's fascination with classical themes and the exploration of human emotion through mythological subjects. painting The Provost of the Merchants, Etienne Marcel and the Dauphin Charles, by Lucien Méling, is a dramatic narrative piece that captures a pivotal moment in French history. It portrays the intense scene of Etienne Marcel, the Provost of the Merchants, who represents the interests of Parisian bourgeoisie, asserting his political influence over the Dauphin, the future Charles V. In this scene, the power dynamics are vividly represented. Marcel, dressed in red, is commanding and central, actively participating in the upheaval, while the Dauphin, decked in luxurious robes, appears passive, his posture reflecting surprise and resignation. The tension is palpable, as the figures around them are caught in the act of violence, the murder of the Dauphin's advisors which seals the conflict between the emerging power of the bourgeoisie and the traditional authority of the nobility. Mailing's work, with its detailed costume rendering and the intricate interplay of gazes and gestures, conveys the complexity of political intrigue and the boldness of Marcel's challenge to royal power. The use of red and blue, the colors of Paris, symbolizes the city's revolutionary spirit against the feudal system. This historical scene is a representation of the struggle for control and the assertion of the merchant class's newfound power in the governance of France. In the painting, Charlotte Corday, by Paul Jacques Aimé Baudry, we witness the immediate aftermath of one of the French Revolution's most shocking moments. Charlotte Corday having just assassinated the radical journalist Jean-Paul Marat, stands with an air of determined calm. Baudry captures the complexity of Corday's emotions. Her face is resolute yet hints at the gravity of her act. The scene is dense with symbolism. Marat, a symbol of the revolution's violent excesses, lies lifeless in his bath, while Corday, dressed in a stripped gown, appears as the personification of justice delivered with a stern hand. The map of France on the wall and the scattered papers suggest the tumultuous state of the nation, with Corday's actions punctuating this period of intense political strife. Baudry's painting is more than a historical reenactment. It is an exploration of the moral and ethical dimensions of power. By focusing on the solitary figure of Corday, he emphasizes the profound isolation that can accompany acts of extreme political conviction. Her solitary stand, even in the face of inevitable punishment, 
reflects the painting's deeper narrative on the intersection of personal conviction and the immense forces of historical change. As one of Felix Felotin's final works, Romanian Woman in a Red Dress exemplifies his return to the human figure and interwar realism. The woman's direct gaze and the vibrant red of her dress create a compelling image of allure and confidence. Velotin's use of a single colour to envelope the subject creates a sense of intimacy and focus. The dress itself is adorned with delicate patterns that suggest a meticulous attention to detail, highlighting the woman's form and suggesting a certain allure. Her pose is relaxed, yet there's an undeniable tension in her slightly slouched posture and the grip of her hand on the chair. Her gaze is directed away from the viewer, as if caught in a moment of contemplation or invitation, further adding to the enigmatic quality of the portrait. Valotin's technique in this work is also notable. He employs a smooth, almost illustrative quality to the paint, which gives the subject a luminous quality. The shadows and highlights on her skin and dress are rendered with a subtle gradation, drawing the eye to the texture and flow of the fabric, as well as the softness of her skin. The woman's expression is particularly evocative. Her slightly parted lips and the direct, yet unfocused, gaze seem to hint at an inner world of emotion that is both private and provocative. The careful balance between the revealing dress and her demure demeanour plays into traditional notions of seduction, where what is alluded to is as powerful as what is shown. Velotin's painting is a masterful example of how colour, composition and technique can converge to convey a complex theme such as seduction, leaving the viewer to ponder the story behind the woman's enigmatic expression. In Marie-Denise Villers' Etude de Femme de Presnature, the viewer is presented with a scene steeped in the quiet anticipation of seduction. The painting, true to the neoclassical style, is composed with a clear, controlled linearity that showcases the grace of the subject. The woman is captured in a moment of personal preparation as she bends to tie her ballet shoes. This act, while mundane is rendered with a tenderness and attentiveness that transforms it into an intimate prelude. The inclusion of elements, such as the discarded gloves and the solitary rose on the bench beside her, infuses the composition with a narrative quality, suggesting a preceding or forthcoming event of romantic or social importance. Villers' skill as a portraitist is evident in the way she renders the woman's expression there's a delicacy in the tilt of her head and the softness of her gaze that seems to reach beyond the canvas, inviting the viewer to ponder her innermost thoughts. The sheer lace veil draped over her hair adds a layer of modesty, yet her direct gaze and the slight opening of her lips speak to an underlying boldness. The backdrop of the painting is a landscape that, while subdued, provides a contrast to the detailed figure directing the viewer's focus to the woman and her actions. Villers' mastery lies in her ability to convey a narrative of seduction through subtlety and suggestion, rather than overt displays, allowing the viewer to become an active participant in uncovering the story within the painting. Marshall Race's Made in Japan La Grande Odalisk is a provocative reimagining of classical beauty through the lens of pop art. Race deliberately subverts traditional aesthetics by employing an unconventional palette, notably the apple green for the skin of the odalisk, which in itself challenges the viewer's expectations. This striking color choice not only draws attention, but also alienates the subject from her historical context placing her firmly within the artist's contemporary commentary. The vibrant, almost electric, colours and the patchwork of patterns on the headscarf create a visual dissonance 
that is characteristic of pop art's often brash approach to classical subjects. The intentional omission of one eye and the addition of a fly on the head of the odalisk are jarring elements that serve to critique and satirize the idealization of female beauty in art history. By doing so, race invites a conversation on the objectification of women's bodies in art, and perhaps more broadly in society. These alterations disrupt the harmony and grace typically associated with such figures, instead evoking a sense of unease. Paris Bourdon's mythological couple is a captivating portrayal of intimacy and affection that transcends time, drawing upon the rich tapestry of classical mythology to tell a story of love and seduction. The subjects are rendered with an exquisite tenderness. Their close physical proximity and the delicate exchange of glances speak to a deep emotional bond. The possible identification of the figures as Daphnis and Chloe characters from Greek mythology known for their pastoral romance, adds a layer of narrative to the composition, inviting the viewer to reflect on themes of pastoral innocence and romantic love. The circular format of the painting, known as a tondo, creates a sense of completeness and focus, encapsulating the couple in their private world. Bourdon's mastery of colour is evident in the vibrant contrast between the man's lush, blue drapery and the woman's sumptuous pink gown. These rich hues highlight the sensuality of the scene and amplify the emotional intensity between the figures. The intricate details, such as the texture of the man's laurel wreath, the delicate strands of the woman's pearl necklace, and the verdant foliage that envelops them, enrich the visual experience providing a feast for the eyes that complements the romantic theme. In this work, Bourdon invites the viewer to witness a moment of tender connection that is both of its time and enduringly human. Albert Marx's La Femme Blonde is a study in the subtle power of form and the intrinsic beauty of the human body. The nude subject is depicted with a serene directness her gaze confronting the viewer with quiet confidence. Mark's technique strips away the superfluous, focusing instead on the play of light and shadow across the woman's body, which gives the painting a sculptural quality. The background, with its soft, floral motif, contrasts with the solidity of the figure, highlighting her presence and the natural curves of her form. This juxtaposition creates a dialogue between the figure and the space she occupies, emphasizing the natural as opposed to the adorned or embellished. The square format of the painting, an unusual choice for a portrait, further emphasizes the geometry and balance within the composition, drawing the viewer's eyes to the symmetry and poise of the figure. Mark's approach to the seductive theme is not through explicit action or context, but through the appreciation of the form itself. The simplicity of the rendering borders on abstraction, leaving details to the imagination and focusing on the essence of form. This stylistic choice aligns with the early 20th century artistic movements that sought to reduce subjects to their fundamental components. La Femme Blonde thus becomes a meditation on form a celebration of the human body's inherent beauty and sensuality without resorting to the overtly erotic, and invites a contemplative rather than voyeuristic gaze. Jacob Van Loo's Young Woman Going to Bed is emblematic of the Dutch Baroque's intricate relationship with sensuality and intimacy. The painting is a study in the art of suggestion, where the act of undressing is captured as both a moment of vulnerability and of control. The subject's nudity is presented with a candidness that is characteristic of the period, highlighting the natural beauty and the allure of the female form. Her gaze, which invites the viewer's eye over her shoulder, establishes a connection that is intimate and somewhat conspiratorial as if the viewer has stumbled upon a private moment. 
The luxurious textures of the drapery, the rich velvet, and the opulence of the bedclothes are painted with meticulous detail, emphasizing the contrast between the softness of the skin and the sumptuousness of the surroundings. This contrast not only reinforces the physicality of the subject, but also enhances the sensual atmosphere of the setting. Van Loo's masterful use of light and shadow plays across the curves of her back, drawing attention to the graceful line from the subject's termed head to her poised feet. The discarded clothing and shoes add a narrative element, suggesting the end of a day or the beginning of the night's intrigue. Young woman going to bed thus engages the viewer in a visual dialogue that is rich with the themes of seduction and the private turned public, a hallmark of the Baroque fascination with the depiction of everyday life and the celebration of personal, intimate moments. Olympia by Gidor Manet stands as a revolutionary work in the history of art, marking a significant departure from the traditional portrayal of the female nude in painting. Manet's Olympia is not the idealized Venus. She is a real woman with a confrontational gaze and a body depicted in a stark, almost harsh light. This candid representation strips away the mythology and romanticism typically associated with such subjects, instead presenting a figure who is in control of her sexuality. Her gaze is direct and challenging, engaging the viewer in a dialogue about the nature of power and seduction. It is not she who is vulnerable to the viewer's gaze, but rather the viewer who is made to feel as if they are intruding. The composition of the painting, with Olympia's hand assertively placed upon her body, serves as both a display of her autonomy and a barrier against the outside world. The presence of the maid and the black cat adds layers of social and symbolic complexity to the scene, hinting at the themes of race, class, and sexuality. Manny's use of broad, confident brushstrokes and a stark contrast between the pale figure and the dark background emphasizes the defiant nature of the subject. Olympia challenged the conventions of the Parisian art world when it was first exhibited, and it continues to provoke discussion about the dynamics of the gaze, the role of the female in art, and the power structures within society. This work is not just a representation of seduction. It is a bold statement about the subject's agency within it. Titian's Venus of Urbino is often heralded as the epitome of Renaissance sensuality and a paragon of the portrayal of the nude form. The goddess Venus is depicted not as a distant mythological figure, but as a woman of flesh and blood, one who exudes confidence in her own skin. Her reclining pose on the sumptuous bedclothes, her hand strategically placed, is as much an assertion of her control over her sexuality as it is an invitation to the viewer. The directness of her gaze breaks the fourth wall, engaging the viewer in an intimate and somewhat challenging exchange, blurring the lines between the observer and the observed. The luxuriousness of her environment, with rich textiles and intricate details, underscores the idea of Venus, and by extension, beauty and love, as being at the heart of the domestic space a treasure to be revered and celebrated. The maids in the background, engaged in a seemingly mundane task, juxtapose the everyday with the divine, grounding the goddess in the reality of Renaissance life. Titian's masterful use of color and light enhances the tactile quality of the skin and fabrics, rendering the painting alive with warmth and texture. The Venice of Urbino is not just a depiction of a goddess, it is a nuanced study of seduction that combines physical beauty with psychological depth, creating a lasting symbol of desire that has intrigued and inspired viewers for centuries. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. Your support helps me continue creating more content like this. Thank you.